Hey, uh, Martin, would you get that door? Thank you. Hello again, everybody, and welcome back for our uh, fifth and final class in the Celtic Christianity and World of St. Chad series. I'm excited about today, but we have a lot to cover. <laughs> I'm going to try to uh, move quickly, at least in the first part, because I want us to have some chance at the end for some discussion. Um, but that doesn't mean, you know, feel free to ask questions and interject along the way uh, also. Uh, as always, a little reminder that we have um, stuff posted on uh, the YouTube channel that then is getting posted to the Facebook page. Should you want to share this or should you want to catch up? And a word about uh, class two, I still have not had time to go back and try and re-record uh, that Taping got uh, messed up uh, for that. Um, but I want to open us with a brief word about St. Aidan and then a prayer that's attributed to St. Uh, Aidan. Uh, St. Aidan was the, Linda, uh, the founder of the monastery at Lindisfarne from Irish descent. Uh, and then he spent some time over at the Iona Monastery in Scotland. He's regarded as the apostle to North Umbria, uh, so the part of Britannia that lies north of the Umber River, uh, basically right there at the cusp of where Scotland begins. Um, and uh, he planted Lindisfarne on the island. Uh, it's actually a peninsula, if you will, because at low tide, there's a land bridge that you can walk across um, we'll get back to that in a little bit. So Aidan studied with Columba, uh, St. Columba, if you've heard of him. And I'm going to start us with this prayer, and I think if you'll listen to it, you'll pick up a little bit on where he was, so his place or location, and also his life's work. So the Lord be with you. Be with you. Let us pray. Leave me alone with God. As much as may be, as the tide draws the waters close in upon the shore, make me an island set apart, alone with you, God, holy to you. Then with the turning of the tide, prepare me to carry your presence to the busy world beyond, the world that rushes in on me, till the waters come again and fold me back to you. Amen. Amen. See how that beautifully encapsulates his work of evangelism and also his place uh, where he lived. Uh, so it's said that Aidan uh, came to the land of Northumbria when uh, King Oswald was in power, and he was able to convince King Oswald to convert to Christianity, and then Oswald offered him some land to start a monastery where he was going to begin his ministry. Now, Aidan, having some wisdom already, saw a good reason for a little bit of separation between church and state, if you will. Um, so that's why he requested the peninsula, or the island, uh, which could see the castle from where he was, but he was a little bit removed from it. Um, there's a saying that I like by Tony Campolo, it says, mixing politics and religion uh, uh, politics with religion is like mi mixing ice cream with horse manure. <laughs> it doesn't do much to the manure, but it does a lot to the religion. <laughs> or <laughs> it ruins the ice cream. I, I kind of botched it, but you get the gist. <laughs> Either way, it tastes terrible. So, um, Aiden also was given a horse, as I mentioned, and if you uh, in the sermon, uh, and Aiden promptly gave that away because he deemed others to uh, need it more than himself, which is something that we'll see paralleled with uh, St. Chad's own uh, life and example in a little bit. Uh, St. Aidan died in the year 651. So remember 651, because I'm going to be throwing a few dates at you 
Um, let's see. I think this is the right slide. Let's see. This is actually how you would spell Chad's name in Old English, by the way. Um, C-E-A-D-D-A. -D -D -A. Uh, St. Chad of Litchfield. It's got his years. Uh, 634 is when he was born. They're guessing about 672. So he was about 40 years old. Um, and uh, some, some say 673, but a little bit of a question mark surrounding that. Um, so we finally get to talk about St. Chad. All this lead up, and today's the day. I'm excited. Uh, Chad and his, uh, was one of four brothers, believed to possibly be of some noble descent, although they don't really have any record of that. Uh, but it, it was common for people who had some kind of nobility in their background to maybe become priests uh, or something. And so... Uh, he and his three other brothers all went to live at the monastery at Lindisfarne. Uh, we think Chad was the youngest. Again, we don't really know. We know for sure that his brother Sed, that's spelled C-E-D-D. -D. Uh, we know for sure that his brother Sed was a little older. The other two, we're not really sure. Um, but they came to be formed under, uh, formed in the faith under St. Aidan. Uh, and as I said, St. Aidan died in 651. So, um, so in the middle of Chad's formation as a monk, and then eventually somewhere along the way towards ordination in the priesthood, uh, Aidan died, which meant that Chad had to finish his studies elsewhere. It had been disrupted, which is when it, uh, it's believed that he went on a journey to Ireland with another person who later became a famous saint, uh, somebody named Egbert. Anybody ever heard of Egbert? Mm -hmm. I hadn't heard of him until studying this, but also an interesting story. Uh, so they went off to Ireland together to study. Um, let's see, and I also wanted to mention, I didn't, I should have put the names of the brothers up here. I don't have them memorized, but they're all very similar. They all start with C's. They're all kind of like this. Mm -hmm. And if you do some of the study about the, the language, uh, you can tell that they came from Celtic background, not Anglo-Saxon <coughs> background, which is just another little tidbit I picked up while looking into this. So, as Chad was in Ireland pursuing his studies, a little bit of a conflict was kicking up back home. And this conflict is what led to the event that we call the Synod of Whitby. So, uh, here's a little shot of the, monastic, the ruins that are at Whitby now. Obviously, at this moment in history, when Chad was alive, there would have been a few small wooden buildings, and that's about it. Uh, this is the ruins of a nice big church that you see here, and this would have been kind of the monastic grounds uh, here. Anybody been to this place? Have you? Do you have any... Uh, any Tidbits you want to share or anything, or it just looks like a neat spot to visit. Okay. Amazing pictures if you Google search for uh, Whitby. Now, where is Whitby again? Uh, it is so like um, if this is England, and right here is kind of where Scotland begins. Okay. Uh, there's York here, yes. and it's kind of right here. Okay. So, uh, kind of in the same, they're all in the same area. Uh oh. Let's see. All right, let's see if that's still going. So, at this moment in history, uh, the abbess of Whitby was a woman named Hilda, who is also a saint. Everybody who was a player back then got that, I guess. <laughs> um, anyway, um, she was of the Celtic tradition, as was this monastery at the time. Men and women were both It was run under the Celtic, Celtic rite. It's worth noting that uh, when they gathered to have this, uh, this meeting where they were going to sort through some of the dissension, there was no such thing as neutral ground on which they could meet. So they met at this place. Uh, and everything going into the synod was kind of leaning towards continuation of the Celtic ways as opposed to adopting the more Roman ways, including by the king who supported that and just the very place of where they held the meeting. Uh, people came from far and wide to attend, uh, even the continental Europe area. This was called by King Oswego, 
So a new king now, a king who was known for his uh, vengeance and wrath, so you didn't want to get on the wrong side of him. Uh, the archbishop was not in attendance at this because he was either very sick or had already died, but he died the same year that the synod happened. Uh, and that's another theme that we'll hear over and over again today is the plague taking people out. Um, so the purpose of having the synod... Uh, was to clear up the dissension between the Celtic and Roman church. Uh, and if you think about it, being called by a king, it probably had some underpinning uh, political reasons too, because a lot of times uh, kings would use legitimacy by the church as a way of kind of empowering their own sense of legitimacy and strengthening their hold in a place. So you can imagine that King Azuayo probably had some mixed motives. Uh, but here's a quote by him that uh, Bede records, which is, by the way, the source of most history that we can get from this moment. Uh, St. Bede, uh, or often called the Venerable Bede, wrote this book of English history we'll be pulling heavily from today. Uh, Oswego says, It is fitting that those who serve one God should observe one rule of life and not differ in the celebration of the heavenly sacraments, seeing that they all hope for one kingdom in heaven. Yeah. So what are these dis divisions that we keep talking about? All right, well, division number one, the date of Easter. Does anybody know how the date of Easter is uh, established? Yes? First full moon, after the spring equinox, after, after, um, yeah, first, after, first Sunday, after the first full moon, after the spring equinox. Right, but the Orthodox have a... And they have a slightly have different way... thing in there. Yeah. So, and yeah, so usually... On, a, on, a, on most years, the Orthodox Easter is about a week or so different from when we do it, um, which is kind of interesting because there's, I just saw the other day uh, a news article about, yet again, another need to have a meeting like this to try and bring those together yet again. Who knows if it'll happen, but theoretically, the uh, Rome and Orthodox and Anglican Church are going to like meet and try to hash through this. Yet again, one of the ideas they're floating is to just pick a day, like sometime in mid-April, and say it's now going to be April 21st or you know third, whatever. Um, which, which I wouldn't hate because spring break sometimes gets. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so. One of the problems that they had was, depending on where your priest was schooled, if they were from a more Celtic or Roman background, they might come to a different date of Easter. And so then you're traveling around, and this little town over here is having Easter one day, this little town's having Easter a different day. Now the Celtic, from what I can get uh, from the, the texts, were pretty okay with this ambiguity. They were fine with that. It was the Romans that really wanted conformity and uniformity. Uh, and so... Um, so this was one of the uh, issues. The other was over haircuts. <laughs> you guys know what a tonsure is? This is the typical kind of hairstyle that you see uh, associated with a friar or monastic. Uh, so this is the Roman style. It's supposed to be associated with the crown of thorns. At least that's the idea behind it. Uh, now, the Celtic people had their own... Uh, um, and people are not really sure what it looked like, except they've heard descriptions of it, and so there's some guesses here as to what it may have looked like. It may have just been shaving the front like this, uh, or it may have been some kind of crazy thing like this, where you've got straight lines shooting over from the sides to make a triangle shape. Here's another picture here that shows kind of more of this style. People don't really know. Obviously, those types of records don't uh, last. Um, but why get so in a fuss over hairstyle? Because it was an outward and visible sign of division in tradition. Uh, also, I should just mention, whatever the Celtic style was, it's also believed that 
that traced back to whatever the Druids used to wear. Uh, so uh, by Rome, this was seen as a difference that was intolerable. Um, so the Celts, uh, in their own spirituality, val valued spiritual depth. Uh, it was intensely interpersonal because of their tribal nature, which women established city kind of model, which was a little more... Uh, separate. Uh, they were very dedicated to scriptural ex exegesis, and they saw, because of their values, they saw the Romans as being materialistic and preoccupied. A whole bunch of concert on, on Easter morning, and I was like, So anything that contradicted the Roman hierarchy was seen as kind of a challenge to the foundational doctrines of the church with regards to ordination. Um, so Rome saw the Celtic church as schismatic, uh, and the Celtic bishops didn't accept the new Archbishop of Canterbury that was being sent over to lead them all from Rome. So these are some other things that kind of flesh out. It wasn't just Easter and the haircut. Um, it's worth also noting, as you might imagine, that in, on the northern parts of the island, it leaned more Celtic, and on the southern parts of the island, which had been controlled by Rome in prior uh, centuries, uh, they obviously leaned more Roman. So they gathered together at the Senate to discern uh, their future together. There was potential for breakup. Uh, Bishop Coleman of Lindisfarne was going to argue on behalf of the Celtic Church, and Bishop Egelbert of Wessex was supposed to argue on behalf of the Roman Church. However, Bishop Egelbert's grasp on Old English was a little bit weak, and some suspect that because he was formed in the Celtic tradition, he also wasn't super motivated to advocate on behalf of Rome. Um, so he appointed a young abbot named Wilfred, remember that name, uh, to argue on his behalf. And uh, so Wilfred kind of took up the Roman side. <clears throat> now, I have to read this to you because it's juicy. And when there's juicy history, it's just worth checking out. Um, eventually, the way Rome prevailed is by essentially using their nuclear option of threatening uh, hell, right? <laughs> um, this is not working. I'm just going to have to re-record this later. Um, let me just see here if I can do this. Oh, I don't have it. Why is that not working? I apologize. We're too bad. So, listen to this carefully. Uh, and with regard, this is somebody arguing on behalf of Rome. <laughs> And with regard to your father, Columba, because they're hearkening back to the, the Celtic tradition, and holiness you claim, uh, rules and customs you claim to have been supported by heavenly signs. I can only say that when many shall say to our Lord at the last day of judgment, have we not prophesied in thy name and cast out devils and done wonderful works, the Lord will reply, I never knew you for using their Celtic ways. Um, it gets better. Far be it from me to apply these words to your fathers, meaning the Celtic uh, lineage, for it is more just to believe good rather than evil of those whom one does not know. So I do not deny that they were true servants of God and dear to him, and that they loved God in primitive simplicity, little, uh, but in devout sincerity, nor do I think that their ways of keeping Easter were seriously harmful so long as no one came to show them a more perfect way to follow. <laughs> but you and your colleagues are most certainly guilty of sin if you reject the decrees of the apostolic see, indeed of the universal church, which are confirmed by holy writ. For although your fathers were holy men, do you imagine that they, 
A few men in a corner of a remote island are to be preferred before the universal church of Christ throughout the world. Are to be preferred before the universal church of Christ throughout the world. And even if you're Columba, or may I say ours also, if he was a servant of Christ, was a saint potent in miracles, can he take precedence before the most blessed prince of the apostles, to whom our Lord said, Thou art Peter, and upon the rock I will build my church? <laughs> Do you hear all this? <laughs> um, so yeah, it was probably a heated thing, I'm sure. Um, so the Roman church prevails. Uh, many still are saddened by this. Bishop Coleman of Lindisfarne took up his relics of the now dead St. Aidan and went packing uh, back to, I think, Scotland. Um, and it's worth also mentioning uh, a few others who were on the scene. So St. Said, Chad's brother, was definitely a part of the Synod. Now, St. Chad, we don't know for sure if he was a part of the Synod or not. Uh, it's very likely that he was there. How big of a, a voice in that, we don't really know. But none of that's recorded by St. Bede. Uh, what is recorded is his work following the Synod of Whitby and kind of picking up the pieces and trying to reestablish equilibrium. Let's see, how am I doing on time so far? Okay, not too bad. Um, let's see. So why do I have the map up here? Um, <clears throat> so following the Senate at Whitby, and now we can see some of these places. So here's Whitby up here. Here's York. Um, Following and, there, and there's lasting him, all right? So St. Said, the brother of St. Chad, was, in addition to being um, the bishop of a little hamlet called London, he was also the abbot of a monastery in Lastingham, and probably another one as, as well. Uh, so this is where Chad was hanging out at this moment. Uh, at Lastingham at this monastery. St. Said goes there. He gets the plague. He dies. Now, it's said that a bunch, about two dozen of his clergy, hearing that their bishop had died, were very saddened by this. They make the journey up to Lastingham. They all die, too. Um, Chad does not die, and for whatever reason, he is promoted to fill his brother's place, so he becomes abbot at Lastingham. <coughs> so, Senate at Whitby wraps up. Um, Chad becomes uh, abbot here. As an abbot, Bede writes about him that he was very committed to his own regime of prayer and study. He was always clothed in humility and kindness. He abided by Celtic values, specifically of simplicity and ascesis. Anybody remember that word from last week? It's kind of the shunning of material things and... Uh, Embrace of the rigor of a life spent in prayer and fasting and essentially in poverty, right? Uh, so this was uh, Chad's way. Uh, also, it's written again and again in that book. There's about 20 pages that kind of cover Chad's life and some of the kind of peripheral people uh, in this book. And uh, it's said again and again, it just talks about his love for studying of Scripture. So... For what it's worth, that was also a part of who he was. Now, a word about the political landscape real quick, because I do think it's interesting. So you had a pagan king over here in the land of Mercia. I think his name was Pinda. And he was at war with the king of Northumbria. Now, this is a little bit pre-Senate uh, of Whitby time. So this king comes over and conquers this land, this land takes about 10, 15 years to regroup. They go down and conquer this land. Okay, so this is about when Chad hits the scene because this king has conquered this land and now he's going eventually to uh, install Chad as the bishop of this land. So you see how that's also kind of a power move? <laughs> and like sending his person down there uh, later so that he's got some kind of influence there. <clears throat> um, 
Because as I said, kings at this time were always preoccupied with trying to secure their own legitimacy. Um, so this brings us to the battle royale. St. Chad versus St. Wilfred. Remember I told you this was the advocate for the Roman side at the Synod of Whitby. All right, so of course he's going to get rewarded for his hard work at that synod, right? Especially for advocating for Rome. It's worth noting that when he was real young, he went and studied, I think it was at the, the archdeacon to the pope at the Vatican. So he was very enmeshed in the Roman world, uh, which was probably why he was chosen to advocate for Rome. Um, so he's going to, because Coleman takes off, he's going to replace, there was another bishop who was there for maybe months before dying of plague. And then he's going to be elevated to fill this spot uh, at, let's see, they, they changed the name of the diocese about three times. So at this point in history, it was the Diocese of North, North Umbria, but when they appoint Chad to the sea, it's the Diocese of York, I believe. And today it's the Diocese of York, uh, Durham. So I'm sure I lost you. N.T. Wright was the Bishop of Durham, if you're familiar with him, so little connectivity there. Also, I think Justin Welby, the Archbishop for today, was the, the Bishop of Durham. <clears throat> so, sorry for the extra information, uh, throwing a bunch of names at you. Um, so, being the voice of the Roman side, um, appointed to fill this bishopric spot, he needs to gather at least three bishops to have a legitimate consecration. Uh, as a bishop. And he doesn't want, uh, well, one, they were down a bunch of bishops because of the plague. And two, he doesn't want all these Celtic people uh, doing his service. He wanted people. So he sets off for Gaul and gets in a shipwreck. And so his trip takes quite a while. And the king is getting impatient because he needs a bishop. So he appoints Chad from Lastingham, if you'll remember. So he's already there on the scene. His brother is a bishop who just recently died. So he sees Chad and he says, this guy's going to make a good bishop. Um, let's see, did I put the slide up there? <clears throat> this is probably too small for you to be able to see, but here's some timetables for these different dioceses. Here's York, Lindisfarne, and Mercia. And so we can see uh, where the where people fall. So here's Chad, 664, same year as the Synod of Whitby, uh, to 669. So Bishop of York. So this is how long York before Wilfred arrives back and is reinstalled by the new Archbishop of Canterbury. And if you weren't at the 8 a.m. service, that's exactly how that happens. So Wilfred does eventually come back a bishop, except he finds that his see is occupied. So he just kind of hangs out on the sidelines, knowing there's a new archbishop coming soon, and that he'll fix things. And sure enough, when Theodore gets there, he says, no, 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 no. You need to go over here, and you need to come over here. So we get Wilfred over here as the bishop of the Diocese of York. Chad goes back to his monastery at Lastingham, thinking that's where he's going to spend the rest of his life. And then Mercia needs a bishop. So... 669, uh, Chad goes to Mercy. He's only there for about three years before he dies. Uh, but apparently that three years was a really profound three years for that part of the church. Let me just check my notes to see if I'm roughly on target. So Bishop Chad becomes Bishop of Mercia and the Lindsay people. So at this moment when he's asked to give up his position as bishop here, that's where we get that famous line that Bede records uh, by Chad where he says, if you decide that I have not rightly received my Episcopal ordination, I will willingly lay down the office, for I have never thought myself worthy of it. But under obedience, I thought, though unworthy, I would consent to undertake it. So... Again, displaying that characteristic Chadian uh, humility. Maybe I should just pause. I feel like I'm... Yes? We can certainly see why Chad needed a horse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I mean, look at the... 
Look at the territory that eventually became his to try and cover, right? So, yeah, and speaking of that, that's the next thing in my story, actually. So apparently I was thinking kind of in the same vein as you. So he gets... I'm trying to wait till the sermon. Oh, no, 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 we're going to go into it now. So he gets, so, he, so he's Bishop uh, of Mercia, and he doesn't want to use a horse because it's a symbol of power and of wealth and of might. Uh, you know, you think horses that would be taken to battle. And he doesn't want to, that doesn't go with this whole kind of Celtic, simplistic way. So he's traveling on foot. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Theodore, uh, insists that he rides a horse, and there's even stories in here of Theodore lifting him into the saddle. I'm sure that's apocryphal, but it kind of conveys the purpose. Um, I'm not really sure if Theodore was saying, you need to cover more ground, or if he was saying, no, 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 you're worthy of this, you need to embody it, or exactly what that was, uh, probably the latter. Um, but I think, I think often it kind of mirrors when we get to Palm Sunday, Jesus riding a donkey into Jerusalem instead of a horse. And you got the Roman soldiers coming into Jerusalem the same day on the other side with their war horses. And he's coming in on a piece of farm equipment. And so it's that embodiment of humility there. Um, so a couple of other things about Chad. He was regarded as a wonder worker. Uh, it said that he would pray in a well at the monastery. Uh, let's see, so eventually he winds up planting a monastery here. This becomes his seat of uh, his bishopric in the land of mercy, Litchfield, uh, which had a different name at the time. Um, and so he's got his monastery here um, and would travel out to visit the different corners of the place. Um, and there, Today is where St. Chad's Parish is, and on the church grounds uh, is a well that it said St. Chad would go down into the well to pray as a place to get away from all the hubbub, and people would know that he was in the well because they would see a light pouring up from inside the well towards the sky when he was there, uh, just kind of another way of conveying how holy of a man he was. Um, it's said that his prayer would cure illness and rid people of possession. Um, he was a source of forgiveness and peace and reconciliation in his community. Um, and I think that also plays into the, his being a bishop in this time. Because you can imagine, he's got, I mean, do you guys, does anybody remember when the bishop here said, let's stop saying the hallelujahs at the end of the service? Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You remember when we got that? Like, no, we're saving that for Easter. Don't use that. Now imagine taking the Celtic liturgy and saying we're going to do Roman. <laughs> that would be a much bigger change. And so the peacemaker presence uh, that Chad was trying to bring to his work. Um, all right. Let's see, that's, I guess I'll be re-recording this lesson. Um, the cross. Oh, here we go with the, uh, so here's the, the Litchfield Cathedral. So here is the well that you would see at St. Chad's Parish today. Oh my goodness, I can't remember which one this is. This is not the parish because uh, there are pictures of it out there and it looks very different. Uh, that might be part of this. This here is very different. Uh, that might be part of this. This here is St. Chad's College. So there's also a college there. Um, just a word about the cross. Uh, St. Chad's cross is a combination of two other crosses. So you have the quadrate uh, cross here. It reminds us of the four evangelists going to the four corners of the earth. It's also the number four kind of associated with uh, the elements of the earth um, and the directions of the, of the map. Uh, we have the Teutonic cross, which is the four towels kind of bound together in the center. Often later, it's uh, the Teutonic order. Um, and so St. Chad's cross 
there really isn't much that we can find about um, where the symbol came from, but it's just used by all those churches affiliated with Chad's legacy. Um, so if you'll remember, at the beginning of this class, we talked about learning goals. I thought it'd be good to kind of revisit those and refresh where we've been. We were going to talk about some of the history of Celtic civilization. My hope is that you feel like you have a little bit better grasp of that. It's a big sweeping timeline. I'm listening to a podcast right now that covers it. I'm on episode 46. <laughs> and it goes a lot further than that. So there's a lot to learn, clearly, if you want to get into the history further. Uh, an awareness of Celtic Christianity's unique attributes, hopefully, can anybody name one of those? Simplicity. Humility. Yeah, simplicity. Humility. Humility. Place. Connectivity with nature. Kind of a more egalitarian sharing and uh, communal uh, vibe there. So um, we talked about some pivotal Celtic figures and saints. Um, we talked about some short, my apologies for that, we'll have to do more for the future, I suppose. Uh, and then we've talked about St. Chad and some of the circumstances surrounding his life. Um, I want to pause here and ask, does anybody have any questions that we didn't get at? No, that would just be the associated by a good question. I don't know. Aiden was, um, you know, the abbot there, and also the bishop. And in this period in history, with no seminaries to be prepared for ordination, essentially what you would do is live at a monastery and study under a bishop. So it could be that um, he had to go somewhere else that, you know, because he was in the process and he had to be formed by another bishop to finish whatever his, I, you know, who knows if they had any kind of like accreditation standards, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, apparently he needed more. So and another bishop came in there to take his Eventually, place. yes. Well, but and eventually, so yeah. it took a while. Yeah. Okay. I would say that the Celtic uh, people adapted some of the local uh local feeling about life after death and mm -hmm. didn't they adapt some of that feeling of yeah I mean that was one the, of the pieces of continuity between pre-Christian Celtic culture and uh, their view of the afterlife that helped them easily transition into the Christian uh, faith 